And I haven't had a cold in London, where I'm from. All of a sudden, as I was traveling up north, <laughs> I got a cold. And uh, so if you'll bear with me, we'll try and make it through. How many have heard of Gospel Missionary Union before? Oh, we have a few. Good. Okay, great. Well, I don't have to tell you about GMU then. <coughs> we have a whole table back there with literature on it. Please help yourself. And uh, it's all free, so I know you will. Don't be afraid to pick up any of the magazines. You will not be put on any subscription list, as some people are afraid of. And especially um, pick up the magazines. There's um, the magazine on your left on my left hand side has excellent articles on what's happening in Italy in Argentina and these are exciting days as I'll tell you in a few minutes and uh, there's uh, one fellow who goes out in the street he does uh, street evangelism and it's an exciting article um, as he is relating what God is doing in the country of Italy you know Italy is one of the hardest places to win people to Christ yeah, here's a guy who goes out with a, a board and, and does street evangelism, and he's seeing people one to the Lord. Of course, we know that no bill was too great for God, and that's what he's finding in one particular area of Italy. And then on the other side, there's a magazine on Russia. An exciting ministry in Russia has opened to us as evangelicals in North America, and uh, you'll be excited as you read the articles in there. Well, Gospel Missionary Union is 100 years old. So if you haven't heard about the mission, where have you been? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's 101. We have 450 missionaries within GMU, and we're working in 26 different countries around the world. 24% um, <clears throat> of our mission population is Canadian, so there are a lot of Canadians in GMU. And... Uh, it's exciting to see what God is doing around the world. If you would uh, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, this is your word. It isn't man's. We pray, Father, this morning that you would open our eyes, that we might behold the wonderful truths of your word. We pray that you would open our minds, that we might comprehend and understand what your word has to say to us. And Father, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we would take that message and we would apply it to our lives. We commit this time unto you, Lord, and pray that in everything that is said and done, you would receive the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 16, beginning at verse 7. For I do not wish to see you now just in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time, if the Lord permits. But I shall remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Paul was writing to the Corinthians. Now, the Corinthians were having their own problems within their church. And uh, his great desire was to go and see them. However, he was in Ephesus, and uh, he was in the middle of a tremendous open door of opportunity. His heart's desire was to go and visit the Corinthians, but he didn't want to just pass through. He wanted to stay there for a while. And right now, where he wanted to stay was in Ephesus. I want you to notice something as we look at verse 9. He says, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Paul was facing, first of all, a door of opportunity. A door of opportunity. 
And there are three things about this door of opportunity that we want to notice. First of all, it's magnitude. He says that it is a wide door for effective service. A door of magnitude. A great and wide door. Ephesus, you see, was a very strategic city. It was a commercial center. And it was kind of like at the crossroads for all the different nations that were all around. I remember when we lived in Ecuador, we were with ACJB for 14 years in Ecuador. And uh, while we were there, we used to travel through the city of Santo Domingo. And the city of Santo Domingo had to have the worst roads that any city has ever had. But that was the main city where all the trucks had to pass through as they went from the coast up into the high Andes Mountains where Quito was located. And so every time we, every time we had to go f from Quito down to the coast, we had to travel through Santo Domingo. And uh, you always checked your springs in your car before you went. It was just full of potholes, and they were always working there. The problem was that Santo Domingo was located just at the bottom of the mountains, and so all the rain dumped on Santo Domingo. So you had these huge oil trucks that would go through the city wrecking the roads anyway, but then you also had constant rain down there. But Santo Domingo was a commercial center, and all the different trucks would, from, would travel through all the different provinces all had to go through Santo Domingo. Well, Ephesus was kind of like that, only instead of different tribes and different cities that were going through, this was different countries. And there was Paul right in the center where people were coming from all these different countries and all these different uh, people groups traveling through Ephesus. And so as they went through, he would share the gospel with them. And what would they do? They would go back as missionaries to their own people. What a tremendous opportunity it was. What an open door he found. It was a door of magnitude with tremendous potential for even wider impact. You know, today, more than ever before, we live in a day of opportunity with doors of magnitude like we have never seen before. I think of the country of Mali, Africa. Mali was an Islamic nation. And for almost 100 years, missionaries have worked there. For uh, probably about 50 years or more, they saw no results. The people were hardened to the gospel. All of a sudden, there was a tremendous drought in Mali. And as a result of the drought, the, the food supply dwindled and people were starving. And Gospel Missionary Union went to the Canadian government and we said, can you help us? And through the Canadian Development Fund, they, they doubled what GMU was able to raise and we were able to send food over to Mali, Africa. Well, the food was handed out, not by the government officials, but to the Christian churches. And all of a sudden, here were these Muslims going to Christian churches to get their food. And as they were getting their food, they were saying, you know, we thought you Christians hated us. I mean, we remember way back to the Crusades. And, and when you came over here and, and you, you slaughtered our people, and you love us. Look what you're doing. You're providing food for us. As a result of that move by the Gospel Missionary Union directed to the Lord, today we see a massive revival in Mali, Africa. There were two fellows last summer that went over, they were from Briarcrest Bible Institute, and uh, they went over as summer missionaries specifically to show the Jesus film. How many have heard of the Jesus film? How many have seen it? That's been translated into hundreds of languages, and they used it in Mali. So these guys went over and they went from village to village showing the Jesus film. At the end of their two months there in Mali, Africa, they had a thousand new believers. And the missionary force, which is today the smallest that it has been in the history of Gospel Missionary Union working in Mali, they're overwhelmed. They have all these new believers and there's a great need for discipleship among these people. And uh, I mean, it's a great problem to have. I wish we had that problem in Canada. But this is the situation that we see in Mali. 3,000 new believers last year in the country of Mali. 1,000 by just these guys going around and showing the Jesus film. God is working. Tremendous doors of opportunity. And this is what we see in Mali. Let me take you to, to Latin America. 
to Brazil. Brazil, interesting country. The city of Fortaleza, over a million people. Generally, the, the population is under 25 years of age, the majority of the population. And here in Fortaleza, Brazil, there was a boys' school. You see, they have boys' and girls' schools separate down there. They don't have them like we have, mixed together. And this boys' school wasn't the best school in the world. I don't know why boys' schools always have bad reputations in Latin America, but they do. And uh, so the teachers decided they wanted a break. And so they decided, let's have a retreat. And uh, we'll, we'll take the kids to one of the camps for the day. Well, they called around to all the camps. And this school had such a bad reputation that all the camps said, no, we don't want you to come here. Forget it. You know, you're coming, you're going to wreck our place. Forget it. So as a last resort, they went to Gospel Missionary Union, the missionaries. And they said, uh, we know that you have a camp in uh, Fortaleza, and uh, do you think that we could use it for the day? Well, the missionaries saw this as a great wide door of opportunity the, for effective service. And they said, sure, we'll tell you what. You come and use our facilities for the day and give us one hour with your kids. That's all we ask, just one hour to teach them. And the teachers thought, these people are committing suicide. You know, they want to sit with our kids with a Bible for, for an hour. So anyway, these kids went to the camp. And uh, during that hour of Bible study, the kids sat quiet. And the teachers were amazed. They said, they've never sat through classes like this. And they said to the missionaries, would you come to our school and would you teach one hour per day? Would you come and teach the Bible one hour per day in our school? Because we see how good our kids are. And the missionaries said, oh, well, sure, we'd be glad to do that. And so they did. And they started teaching in this school. Well, the other schools found out about it. And they said, how come your school has something that we don't have? And so they went to Gospel Missionary Union and they, and they said, look, could you provide teachers for our schools? Well, today in Brazil, 9,000 children are being taught weekly in the Fortaleza public schools. And they're being taught the Bible. And they're seeing the children turning around because the Word of God changes lives. It's exciting to see the great doors of opportunity that we have, the doors of magnitude. And then, just a few years ago, we all know what happened to the former Soviet Union. It fell apart. And uh, as a result, they have no moral system. They have no ethical system anymore. Communism was what they based their society on, and their society has fallen apart. During that time, or shortly after that time, some Christians managed to go over and show the Jesus film. And the deputy minister of education went up to Campus Crusade, and he said, we want you to show that film in all of our schools. And he also said, and we want you to set up a curriculum to teach Christian morals and Christian ethics in all of our schools. And Campus Crusade said, how many schools are in the CIS? And they said, 120,000, and we want you to come over and teach in our public schools. Well, the, the commission, uh, the people from Campus Crusade said, well, well, we're never going to be able to do this. We don't have enough people. We don't have the materials. And out of that was formed something called the commission. The commission is now made up of 80 plus organizations who are all working to carry out a plan to send 12,000 missionaries to the Confederation of Independent States, as it's called today, over the next five years. People going for one year to share the gospel with the people of the CIS. But imagine, they're saying, come over and help us. It's the modern day Macedonian call. But imagine an open door for 12,000 missionaries to go and teach the word of God in the public schools of the CIS. What if our Board of Education could only get a hold of something like that? As a matter of fact, I was presenting this at a church, and a lady came up to me and she said, could I have your material? Could I have your, could I have your card? And I said, sure, here. And she said, I said, what are you going to do with that? She says, I'm, I, if you don't mind, she says, I'm going to send this to the Minister of Education and let him know what's happening in Russia. And maybe, maybe they'll allow us to do it here in Canada. 
it, uh, another interesting story that came out of the commission was there was an American pastor who was over with the first group uh, to teach in the public schools. And the, uh, the principal came up to this pastor and he said, well, you know, this is fantastic for our school. You know, American children must really be blessed while they have the Bible taught in their schools and to see the Jesus film. And the pastor had to say, uh, we don't have that in the United States. Uh, it's against the law in our schools. And we would say the same thing about Canada. But here's a country who used to be our enemy. An atheistic country. It was based on atheism. And it's saying, we want the gospel. Imagine. That's the door of magnitude that we see in our world today. I can tell you about other countries, like Ecuador, where the, where the door is wide open. I, when I was uh, with HCJB, we, I was with a singing group, and we traveled throughout the country, and we'd go to the Central Park and set up our sound system and, and uh, sing songs of Ecuador and then sing songs of the gospel. And as people were coming out of church, we would, the Catholic church, we would hand them out tracts presenting the gospel to them. And we saw many people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But wide open door. You'd go to any park and do it. You'd go to the, the, uh, uh, a city in Ecuador, and uh, I remember one day we had a whole box of literature. And we were standing there handing out literature on the corner. And a bus came up on the street. And the uh, bus driver stops the bus right in the middle of the street, jumps over the bus, runs across the road, and picks up some literature. Well, the people on the bus thought, hey, this is a good thing. So they all run off the bus, and they all came over to get the literature too. Well, soon you had a traffic jam. Because there's this bus in the middle of the street, and all the people are all over the sidewalk getting the literature. And, uh, well, we, uh, we emptied our box in about five minutes. The people were so hungry for something to read. This was the gospel. And you know, afterwards, there was no literature left on the street. There was no literature left in trash cans. They took that literature and they read it. That's the wide open door that we see today in Latin America. It is a door of magnitude. But also I want you to notice something else. It's a door of ministry. It says that this is a wide door for effective service. Effective service. In order to be effective, it takes people to do it. God working through people. In Ecuador, it takes people handing out the literature, people to lead the Bible studies, people to pastor churches. The trouble is that the people aren't there. In Fortaleza, Brazil, we have this wide open door to teach the Bible in all the public schools in Fortaleza. But you know we don't have enough teachers to do the work. In the commission, we're looking for 12,000 missionaries to go forward into the, the CRS. But what happens if we don't get the 12,000 missionaries? What happens if we fall down and our promise to the CIS? They're going to go to other groups, and they're going to say, please come and help us. And you know, even right now, the Mormons and the JWs and uh, the, uh, the Moonies are already asking the CIS to come into that country. And the Moonies already are in that country. And they're already establishing a similar curriculum to what the commission is using in the schools. Only, of course, instead of worsh worshiping Jesus Christ, the worshiping moon. We need the people in order for the work to be effective. God works through people. God works through people. <coughs> for effective service, which has been open to us. And then there's a third thing about this great door of opportunity, and that is that it's the miracle of the open door. You see, God has opened it. God has opened that door. Just think of the CIS, the former Soviet Union. There's a country that people have prayed for for over 70 years that God would finally open the door. And God did. And people stood there amazed. We shouldn't be amazed at what God does, especially if we've been praying for it. But all of a sudden, there was the building wall falling down. 
And there were all these communist countries all falling apart. And there's a wide open door into Romania and now Albania, a country that they said would never open up. But it is open to the gospel. But God has done it. It hasn't been the efforts of men. God has opened the door. This is a door that, that God opens to us. And as God opens the door, not only does he open it, but he prepares the way. You see, the way has been prepared. He provides for the resources. He provides for the people. If people are just willing to listen to his voice of call, and he also prepares the hearts. I was reading a book called Praying with the KGB. How many have read that book? Has anybody here? That is an excellent book. It talks about really the, the basis for the open door that we see today. There was, a, <coughs> there was a, a minister of government. He was a member of the Supreme Soviet. And uh, he started to go over to the United States while all this was going on uh, uh, in the CIS and find out what democracy was all about. And so he went over and he stayed in Washington, D.C. Well, it just so happened, and I use that in parenthesis, it just so happened we know that nothing happens when God is in control. He was staying in the same hotel as national religious broadcasters were staying in for their convention. And he got bored one day, and he decided he was going to go downstairs and see what all these people were all about. So he went downstairs, and he's walking around, and all of a sudden he hears some people speaking in Russian. And he goes over, and he talks with them, and he finds out these were people who were broadcasting the gospel into his country. And uh, they befriended him, and, and uh, he was introduced to some other people. And he was instrumental and the door being opened to the CIS. Because you see, he became deputy minister of the Supreme Soviet. And he invited this group of men to come over and share the gospel with them. You see, God is opening the door and God prepared that man's heart. He opened the door for that man to go to the United States. He opened the door for him to stay right in the right hotel. God opens the door. This is the door of opportunity that we see today. It's not only a door of opportunity, but it's also a door of opposition. Paul says, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. We all know the story of uh, Demetrius, the silversmith. There was Paul having a great time in Ephesus, seeing people coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and everything was just fantastic, and the, the church was starting to grow, and, and, and things were happening, and all of a sudden, along comes Demetrius, and he was all upset. Why? Because these people are now Christians, and they're not buying his little idols, and he's going out of business, and so he causes a huge riot. Wherever God is working, we're going to see Satan at work as well. Um, uh, an exciting work that we have seen in Ecuador is among the Quechua Indians. The Quechuas were a people that were very, very difficult to reach. As a matter of fact, there was one woman who worked among them for 50 years. And after those 50 years, she could count the number of converts on one hand. But all of a sudden, God began to work. And the Quechua revival took place. And today there are 100,000 Quechua Indian believers in 500 churches. That's what God does. He continues to work and to move. The only problem is that these people came out of persecution. And today, even today, communists are persecuting the Quechua Indians in Ecuador. Where God is working, there's also opposition. Someone has written, a work that has little opposition from the antagonistic system of Satan is one that is doing little work for the Lord. And G. Campbell Morgan says, if you have no opposition in the place you serve, you're serving in the wrong place. Now the Apostle Paul faced opposition, but he wasn't intimidated by opposition. And we find throughout his books to the different churches, his letters to the churches, how he faced opposition. 
To him, great opposition presented greater opportunity for God's greatest work. You see, Paul was an optimist. You know the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? A pessimist sees a problem in every opportunity, and an optimist sees an opportunity in every problem. I remember when we were going through the adoption of our son in Ecuador. Um, all of a sudden, foreign adoptions were closed down, and we had to do all the legwork. We had to go down, sit in offices, wait for letters to be signed. And I was the eternal optimist, and my wife was a pessimist. And yeah, they say opposites attract, right? And so I would say, we're going to go down, we're going to get that letter signed today. And my wife would say, oh yeah, sure, yeah. I, don't get your hopes up. And I would say, well, I just feel that today is going to be the day. And I would go down there, and I would wait all day for the guy to sign the letter. And he'd look at me, and he would go out the door at the end of the day, and he still hasn't signed that letter. And I would go home just like a deflated balloon. And fortunately, my wife was a pessimist, and so she would lift me up again. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I thought, I'm wasting my time doing this. And I thought, what can I do? And so what I did was I took a whole handful of tracks with me. And when I would go down a taxi, I'd give a taxi driver a track. And then when I would sit in the office, there'd be all these people sitting around doing nothing. So I'd give them all a track and they'd have something to do. <laughs> and the secretary, while she was sitting cleaning her nails instead of doing her work, I'd give her a track too. You see, an optimist sees an opportunity in every problem. And that's what the Apostle Paul saw. That's how Paul looked at problems. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, just to, over the page, he says in verse 10, <coughs> or verse 9, Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves, in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Who delivered us from, the great, from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, and on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us, past, present, and future. Paul had an optimistic viewpoint on things. And as Christians, we should. We should see what God is doing. And we should, when the opposition comes, we should turn to him for strength and for guidance. And then um, if we have more time, we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 11, where he says, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who will shine in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despairing. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Why? Because God was working and Paul had the faith to trust in God. That's why he could say that. Even though the difficulties were there. And the Kichwa Indians today, that's why we see 100,000 believers. And they are strong because they have put their faith in God. And when the trials and the problems have come, they have said, we are down, yeah, yeah, but we're not defeated because God will bring the eventual victory. There are doors of opposition. In the CRS today, you've probably all heard that in the Republic of Russia, Parliament has tried to uh, pass legislation saying we do not want evangelicals in our country. That's brought about by the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church is a state church. And they say, we don't need any other religions. We are the church. And Parliament has uh, passed that legislation and went back to Boris Yeltsin for his signing. And he said, I will pass this. You see, first of all, he faced the fact that if he passed it, he would lose all Western support, financial, for a country. But if he didn't pass it, then he would face the ire of the Orthodox Church. So Yeltsin decided, I won't pass it, but I'll present some different proposals. But we know that God has opened the door into the CIS. And uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8 tells us that when God opens the door, no man can shut it. God will shut it if it's necessary. But no man will shut it. And so today we see a wide open door into the CIS. And we need to take advantage of that opportunity while God has given it to us. Because one day the door perhaps might shut. But God is in control of all things. And that's the way Paul looked at the opposition that he faced. So it's a door of opportunity. It's a door of opposition. But finally, I want you to notice that it's also a door of obligation. 
back to uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9. He says, For a wide door for effective service has opened to me. The door has opened to me. It's my opportunity. God has opened the door and prepared the way for me to serve him as his instrument. It's a door of obligation. Individual obligation. A call from God to our, upon our lives to serve him as instruments. It's an inescapable obligation because it's our responsibility to use the talents and the abilities and the gifts that God has given to us to serve him. And the door has been opened to us. I'd like to ask you this morning, how wide is your door of opportunity? You know, all around you are opportunities of service with your neighbors, with your friends, with your fellow believers. There are areas of service. The question is, how wide is your door of opportunity? Do you see that opportunity in the place where you work? Do you see that opportunity in the neighborhood where you are, in the school where you attend? Do you see the doors of opportunity that God has provided for you? How wide is your door of opportunity? And secondly, how available are you? How available are you? When you see those opportunities, are you too busy doing something else? Or would you like to be busy doing something else? Or are we taking advantage of those doors of opportunity that, present, that God gives to us? My father-in-law went to Fair Havens Bible Camp with his wife. And uh, they went there, and the place was full. And they usually stay there. So they decided, well, we'll go down to a motel down the road. So they went into this motel. And uh, as they were signing the registry, the lady said, and what brings you to this area? And they said, oh, we go to, to Fair Haven's uh, Bible camp, and, and we go uh, a couple of times a year. And they said, she said, oh, that, that's really nice. And, and uh, all of a sudden, she started crying. My father-in-law said, are you OK? She said, well, she says, no. She says, um, I, I just lost my husband, and, and uh, I'm trying to keep this business going. And, and all of a sudden, she just shared her heart. And Sharon's dad sat down with her and started sharing the gospel with her because this woman was broken, and she needed Christ. How many of us see the opportunities when they come our way? And how many of us would sit down with someone and today, there are more and more people who are broken and in need of the gospel and are wide open for the right person, the person that God chooses, the person that God opens that door of opportunity to, to sit down and to minister with that, with, with that person who's in need. If God calls us, he not only calls us, he prepares us to prepare our heart if we are open to God working. Not only that, <clears throat> but he also equips us. He gives us the words to speak. Maybe you say, I, 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 Lord, I spoke to somebody like that. Why, well, my father-in-law isn't the best one to be a conversationalist um, as far as the gospel is concerned. I mean, he'll, he'll talk to Christians with no problem at all, but, but he's not one to really get up in prayer meeting and lead the service. And he's not really one to, to, uh, to sit down and share the gospel. I've never heard of him doing that before. But there he was, sitting down and sharing the gospel with this woman. Because God opened that door for opportunity, and he used that opportunity to share the gospel with that woman. But God prepares. God prepares. He equips. And he gives the victory. He gives the victory. You know, we see tremendous doors of opportunity around us in our world today. And God is calling people to be used for him. The question is, are we the people God wants to use? And if we are, will we allow ourselves to be used for him? Will we be open to his call upon our lives? You know, the amazing thing about the gospel is that God called man to be his instrument 
to share the greatest message in history. The message that all the world needs to hear. He could have called his angels to do it. I'm sure he probably would have done a better job. You know, zap. But no, he called us. Stubborn, rebellious man to be his instruments. And that's why he's called each one of us. That's why he saved us. To be his instruments. To share the gospel with men who need to hear it. What are we doing with those doors of opportunity? Right around where we are. It's a tremendous privilege to be a Christian. To be a part of God's family. To be able to say, I am the Father. But with that tremendous privilege also comes a tremendous responsibility. And that is to be God's instrument to be used for him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Apostle Paul who gave us such a great example of a man who saw the op open doors of opportunity and he took advantage of them. He shared the gospel. He stole them in the opposition. Father, around us today are greatest, our, our greatest opportunities. Around the world today, we see doors opening left and right. We need the reapers, Father. Send forth the reapers into the harvest fields. Send forth those who would teach the scriptures in Fortaleza, Brazil. Send forth the, the commission people who would go and share the gospel in the public schools. Send forth those, Lord, who would work among the people of Mali and other areas of the world. And Lord, I'm speaking on behalf of just one mission organization, but other mission organizations are crying the same thing. Lord, send forth the reapers. Send forth the reapers. But Father, right here, right here, there are people who are without Jesus Christ right around us. Open our eyes, Lord, to those great and wide doors of opportunity that are there for effective service if we are just willing to be your instrument. Use us, O oh God, I pray, as instruments to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who need to hear. We thank you for this church, for this ministry here, for this chapel, for this body of Christ. Oh God, I pray for your blessing upon it. May it continue to build and grow with vision to reach others for Christ, I pray. In Jesus' name. For those that uh, <coughs> are interested, I'll be speaking tomorrow morning at 10.30 here on the commission. And uh, I have a video that's produced by Rock Through the Bible. It's very well done, professionally done. Probably something that GMU would have a problem with. But this is a, a well, professionally done video on the commission. It's challenging. But uh, if you want to know what's happening in Russia, this will give you a good idea. And again, please visit the stand at the back. I've got lots of literature, so please help yourself. Thank you very much.